God, we thank you now for your truth that endures to all generations. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke 15. We've been looking at this thought, this idea of celebrating with Christ. Celebrating with Christ. I didn't preach to y'all last time, did I? Okay, all right, all right. Thank you, ushers. Be seated. Uh, let me tell you what I preached at 8 o'clock last Sunday from Luke um, 15. When you read it, um, you will discover that the overall theme, the overwhelming theme of Luke 15 is God in Jesus Christ celebrating the salvation of people. And I argued last Sunday that what make God happy should make us happy. The passion of Christ should be the passion of the Christian. Um, Christ who dwells within us transforms us from the inside out. And working on the inside of us, we begin to love what he loves. So verse 1 says that publicans and sinners drew near to hear Jesus. Jesus is the hypostatic union, undiminished deity, perfect humanity, simultaneously, you know that. Jesus is the heart of God with skin on. And sinners, public sinners, publicans and sinners wanted to hear him. And scribes and Pharisees who were professional church people began to murmur and complain. And they tell the truth even though it's from a sour heart. Do you know what they said? They said, this man receives sinners and eats with them. That is the truth. But it's from a bad heart because these professional church folk were murmuring and complaining that Jesus was eating with sinners and publicans. But they tell the truth. Let me tell you something. I'm so glad that the Lord eats with sinners and receives them. That's why I'm here today. That's why you're here with your Bible and your suit, your dress. Because the Lord receive sinners and eats with them. When people ask, you know, you think you all that because you saved. No. Only reason I'm saved is because the Lord receives sinners and fellowships with them. I ain't all that within myself. It's the grace and mercy of the Lord. So this word received is in the imperfect tense, which meant he kept on. Imperfect tense is an action that does not have an ending in the past. So he kept on receiving publicans and sinners, and it upset church folk because instead of Jesus being necessarily per se in the sanctuary on Sunday morning, he was out there with sinners eating with them. Uh, and a few times he did come to church, he always ran somebody out or made somebody mad. So he begins to tell them this story, which has three or four divisions. Uh, he begins, this is what we talked about last week from verse 1 to verse 7. He says, what shepherd of you, having a hundred sheep 
and one of them wanders off, he doesn't leave the 90 and 9, go get that one, put it on his shoulder, comes back rejoicing, and calls his friends and neighbors to come and party with him all because he just got one sheep back. Because he don't want anybody at the party talking about, man, what's the big idea? Ain't nothing but sheep. You had 99. All you got to do is get a male and female and you can get another one. No, he says that shepherd is concerned about one lost sheep. And then he says, heaven rejoices more over one that repents than over 99 that needed no repentance. Next week, I'll preach from verse 11 where this father, this is a part of the same parable, has two boys. One of them come up. The younger one says, listen, give me everything that come to me because you ain't dying fast enough and let me go off. And he went off into a far country and, and spent all of his money on riotous living. And then he hired himself out as a slave and the slave owner made him feed hogs. And one day he's jealous of the hog food because he's about to eat hog food and he thinks about home. He says, man, I'm, I'm a fool because I can go back home and my daddy got hired servants enough and they got food enough and to spare. So on his way home, he goes back home and his father sees him coming, runs out, grabs him, says to the other servant, look, put, put a ring, a shoe, some shoes on his feet, give him a robe, put a ring back on his finger, all that, and let's celebrate again because that which was lost is found. Twice. There's a party. And people who have the same passion of the host of the party are invited. So today, we have a woman in verse 8. You know, the passion of Christ should be the passion of the Christian. And I find myself praying so many times, Lord, give me more power. Lord, give me provisions. Lord, give me protection. But rarely do I ask for his passion. And God's passion is people. And so many of our churches, our passions are buildings, bank accounts, budgets, religious personalities in the pulpit and in the pew. And we shout about the fact that our preacher is this or our, uh, our mayor is a member of our church. And we've got prominent people in the pews. But that's not what the Lord celebrates. He says that heaven throws a party, a shindig. For some of y'all who know what it is, a wang dang doodle all night long. And it's over the recovery of people. So to paint this picture, he tells a story about a shepherd, tells a story about a father. Now he's going to tell a story about a woman. Or what woman, if she has 10 silver coins and loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me. She sent out an invitation to friends and neighbors and say, come rejoice with me. Why? Because I found the coin which I had lost. In the same way, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. He gives this story about this woman who has 10 silver coins and loses one and throws a fit. Now, she sweeps the house, lights a candle, and when she finds it, she throws a party and invites people who know what it means 
actually the text suggests women. She invites other women. The shepherd invites other shepherds because they don't want anybody at the party talking about what's the big idea. I mean, she got, girl, you got nine other coins. Are you tripping over one? Let me give you this outline, then I'm going to come back and try to work in just in case I don't finish it. You can go finish it yourself. Look at, first of all, her calculations. Her calculating, how she calculates the lost. Then look at her desperation toward the lost. And then finally her celebration in the regaining of that which is lost. The calculating. Let me tell you some stuff that's not very obvious based on the reading of this text. Which woman of you having ten coins? That coin is a drachma. It's, a, 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 it's equivalent to a denarii or a shekel. It's a day's wage. It's, it's the average wage of somebody who worked for 12 hours, a drachma. Uh, she's got 10 of them. And either they are her savings or it's a dowry. Now, this woman is a poor woman. It's a poor woman, and she's so poor until she can't even let one silver coin go to waste. It becomes a concern of hers when she loses this one. Most of y'all will say, uh, you know, what's the big idea? She got nine, but ten was all she had. And you can't talk about somebody about tripping over losing what you might call a libit. When your libit is a whole lot for somebody else. Can I get a witness here? That's one interpretation. The next interpretation is a much bigger problem. That this 10 silver coins, this drachma, is a dowry. Translated two ways, one of two ways. Her husband gives her this. She wears it in public around her head, all ten of them, like a ring, to say that I'm married, I'm spoken for. If she makes a mistake and commits adultery, if they don't stone her, they take one of the coins off. So she walks around in public, everybody will know that she's an adulteress. Here's another picture of a dowry. That's all she owned even though she married. It's almost like a prenuptial agreement which says if I divorce you, the only thing you can take with you is what's on your head. Those 10 days wages. Are y'all here with me? So if she walks around publicly with nine coins while you tripping, that says that she's an adulteress, that she's ungrateful. If she walks around outside with these nine coins in a 10-piece set, then the crown loses value. She loses value. So, and then she sweeps the house, lights a candle, so it's not just dirty and it's not just dark, but it's disgraceful. Now, I'm going to say it to you one more time, see if you can get it. If she goes out in public with this ring, this ten, nine, nine piece in a 10 piece set outside, she's going to be ridiculed. If she goes out in public. If she goes out in public and they see her, They'll know she committed adultery. She's going to be talked about. Lips are going to go to wag. She's going to walk up to a group of women and they're going to be quiet all of a sudden. They're going to be pointing their finger at it if she goes out in public. Watch the grace of God. The grace of God suggests that she loses this coin in private. Because she loses it in the house. Are y'all here with me? She loses it in private because she is careless. Now, she loses it in the house 
Now here's another, here's another idea. Help me, help me, just pray for me. The idea is, of course, it's from the perspective that Jesus is giving about value. Because the coin is lost in the house, but it hadn't lost its value. But we got a problem here because in the first parable with the shepherds, first part, we know who the shepherd is. Jesus Christ is the chief shepherd. In the parable with the father and his sons, we know who the father is. It's the father. But the problem here in this parable is that the woman is the one that loses the coin. See, the sheep wandered off. The boy wanders off. This coin doesn't take legs and wander off. So one of the arguments is that this is the Holy Spirit. But our doctrine messes with us, our theology, because how can God lose something? How can God be careless? Stay with me, it's going to bless you. The idea of this woman being careless and God being careless is that God can lose us. Well, how does he do that? By blessing us. When you were unblessed and you didn't have the job and you didn't have the husband and you didn't have the money and you didn't have the house and you didn't have the car and you didn't have, you weren't a part of the social group, you and God were tight. But soon as he blessed you with the house, the car, the job, and social status, and the husband or the wife, you stop coming to church. That's how God loses us sometimes because Dr. C.A.W. Clark says every time God blesses us, he runs the risk of losing us. Has God lost you? Because he blessed you. Oh, you used to shout and praise God. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Until you got status. And now it doesn't take all that. We need a preacher to teach to us. We don't need all that hooping and hollering and calling old Dan. No, we do need teaching, but we, don't, we need some hollering. Don't go nowhere. Let me tell you why we need hollering. I haven't seen some of y'all Negroes at football games. At fraternity and sorority gatherings. At parties and y'all make all kind of noise. How dare you get in church and say it don't take all that. Has God lost you because he blessed you. Help me, Holy Ghost. Here's another interpretation of this woman that she represents the church who lost members in the house. She represents people who were once in church and somehow or another the church lost it. This woman represents the church whose preacher's children have left the church and haven't been back. Whose choir member's children left the church and haven't been back. Lost out of the house whose Sunday school teachers' children have been lost. You got some people been in church all their life, raised their children in church, had them doing the Easter speech, had them being shepherds at the Christmas play, had them singing in the youth choir, and as soon as that child got old enough not to have to come back to church, they are gone. We lost them. I've got brothers and sisters. My parents, especially by the time I got here, they were 42 years old. My mom and daddy were holy by the time I got here. Perfect. Are y'all here with me? And my sisters and brothers, we were in church somewhere every Sunday morning, every Sunday, if not twice. 
We sung at funerals on Saturday for people that we didn't even know because they didn't have a choir, so we had to sing. In church every Sunday, and I've got sisters and brothers who were wonderful in character, but they're not going to church anywhere today. Lost, and the church lost them. And you sitting here looking at me, you got some too. This woman represents the church with our traditions and customs. Because I don't know, I don't know what might have been said to my sisters and brothers from some Christians that ran them out. And I don't really know what's been said to some of your children, but there is a pretty good reason why they are not in church. You don't know what somebody said to them in the hallway. Or you don't know what they heard somebody say about you. sitting back there listening to somebody talk about my mama singing. That's my mama. I ain't never come back to church and she's standing up there doing the best she can every Sunday and somebody gonna laugh at her. You don't know what somebody said. You don't know. Y'all gonna make me read you. You're too quiet. You don't know what some senior deacon said to your daughter. Or some older lady said to your son, somebody that he respected, and they're gone. We lost them. It's a lost coin, but here's the good news. It hasn't lost its value. Isn't that good news? Still has value inside of the set. Preach, boy. Lost by itself, it has no value. But it has value in the set. Because she can't walk out the house with a nine-piece in a ten-piece set. It hurts her image. That's her calculation. Now watch her desperation. The Bible says that she sweeps the house and lights a candle. I have always thought, and I got to apologize to this woman because I've given her hell for years because I thought she was a dirty woman. She lost it because the house so dirty. No, when you understand the writing, the word sweep here does not mean sweep out. It means sweep up. She's sweeping up piles of dust and dirt. She ain't sweeping it out the house. She's sweeping it inside the house because the coin is evidently in the dirt, but it hadn't lost its value. Oh, God. He's on the corner right now and he's drinking and smoking, but he hadn't lost his value. Ooh, she's somewhere right now doing something she ain't supposed to be doing, but she hasn't lost her value. She belongs in the peace with us. He's deacon material in the peace with us. He'll be a better deacon if he's faithful to the Lord as he is to the liquor than most of the deacons who... Still got value. Just in the dirt. These Jewish houses didn't have windows. So it can be as dark at midnight at midday. She lights a candle because she's looking for something shiny in the dust. She's looking and listening for a tinkling. And the Bible says that she searches diligently. Every corner, every crevice, she is looking for this drachma. She's looking for this one silver piece that fits into a set. Diligently. Epimelos. 
Epimelos, get this, it means that you cancel out every other search for this primary search. This woman ain't worried about nothing else but recovering this one piece of silver so she can put it back in the sack. She's totally consumed with finding this one lost piece of silver with the image of Caesar on it. Because this silver piece that fits in this set that put, she puts on her head has something to do with her image. Oh, God. So Jesus said, just like this woman, is looking for this silver piece because of her image, I'm looking for my lost ones because of my image. And the scribes and Pharisees, y'all sitting around here murmuring and complaining that I've received the lost and I'm eating with them. You don't know what I've been doing. I've been looking for those who complete my image. Now let me tell y'all something since y'all looking at me funny. The church is the image of Christ. All of us fit. Ex-alcoholics, drug addicts, whoremongers, murderers, cheats, backbiters, but we all in here and we fit into the image of God. When you see us, you see what God can do. When you see us, you see a portrait of divine grace. When you see us, you see a manifestation of the mercy of God. We come from everywhere, all kinds of experiences, all kinds of backgrounds, but we're all in this peace, this sin. Oh my goodness, we are out of time, but we are not out of message. Listen, if you want to hear this message to its entirety or view the entire service, there's some wonderful singing and praying and fellowshipping, uh, go to mountcanaan.com. And uh, you can, can click on our YouTube channel or we're on Facebook as well. You can hear that entire message. Listen, watching it on television and watching it uh, streaming is nothing like actually being here to experience it. So make plans to be here.